Hey, hey good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, quick announcements, like it says up there. Uh, I have the homeworks that we do on Friday, um, so you can pick those up at the end of the class for me. Um, I have office hours today uh, at 12 p.m. down in my office, which is room 624, down the elevators, straight ahead from the other doors. They say don't enter, ignore the don't enter business, just go keep going, and you'll get to my office. Um, there's a, you'll know you're there because there's this big orange area of refuge sign. Because they used to have a stamp on the other side. Um, so today, the plan is to finish up the stuff that is going to be covered on the exam for tomorrow, uh, and then uh, move on and introduce language processing. And actually, before we get into language processing bus in particular, we're going to talk about um, the court, major areas of cortex in general, um, the four main cortical lobes, and what they do. Um, and so, uh, but so there's, sort of, there's an outline up there of the plan for today. And the first two things, silent synapses, and then a general recap of long-term potentiation uh, is stuff that is on the exam, and that's why there's a big red line, and then below that is stuff that won't be for the exam for tomorrow. Um, if you haven't already, I do strongly encourage you to read all of the course notes that I sent out for both Unit 1 and Unit 2, uh, and please let me know via email, or come to my office hours if you have questions. Um, even though Megan's out of town, she's available over email, and Amanda also, and all of our emails on the syllabus and everything. Uh, okay, so before we get started talking about long-term potentiation specifics, uh, I just wanted to do, again, a quick poll. Um, so, um, so our options are it's either mostly or entirely presynaptic, that is mostly um, caused by more calcium channels going into the presynaptic terminal, making the drop rate increase higher, or it's mostly or entirely postsynaptic, meaning that there's, most, there's more ample receptors that are added, and that makes the postsynaptic cell more sensitive when there is calcium added or it's some combination of the two. Uh, and so who thinks it's mostly presynaptic, increasing probability of release? A couple of people. Who thinks it's mostly postsynaptic? A lot of people do. Uh, who thinks it's, it's kind of a mix? A few people not so sure. So, um, so anybody want to, um, most of the class now is saying that it's mostly postsynaptic, um, which is, Kind of interesting because the data we just talked about on Friday was, was arguing that it was mostly presynaptic, um, but I may have sort of like given too much of a preview of today. So does anyone want to volunteer like why they think it's probably mostly postsynaptic? It's quite sure. Yeah. Um, was it for the Chuck Stevens study, uh, yeah. I it, it was conducted in a way that really made a lot of sense. Okay. And just makes it seem as though postsynaptic is the correct answer. That one was arguing for presynaptic. It was, I thought it was arguing. No, 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 yeah, this, that one, okay, so yeah, maybe we should go back and return to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, um, actually, let me do a chart for myself here. Um, so what they were doing in that study, uh, and this is certainly going to be relevant for today, too. This is a CA3 cell, which is a presynaptic neuron. It has, in this case, they, um, they convinced themselves that there was a single point of contact um, onto the CA1 neuron that they're reporting from. And so they stimulate the act, and they, and they, they um, in, in the previous studies, they, they were almost certainly always stimulating a handful of axons maybe three, maybe six, not 20, not 10, but you know, some, some small issue number. Um, and the, between those, say, six axons, there were maybe 18 to 25 points of contact being made on a postsynaptic neuron. Um, but despite that fact that, there was, that they didn't know the number of axons in previous studies and didn't know the number of contacts made because those axons branch, they did um, have, have very good reason to believe that no new contacts were being made. And so they could assume, while in was unknown, they could assume that it was constant. Um, and that was the foundation <coughs> of the um, interpretation for, um, for the other one, the Roberta Mallow study, where um, they looked at this um, 
it's measured here, which is mean squared divided by sin. The deviation is squared, um, which, given a couple um, other assumptions, is equal to this. Um, and if that value changes, then then the then they argue that um, it must since in, in, while it is unknown, it remains constant. And so if the value is different before LTP versus after LTP, then the hidden variable they can't directly measure on um, the changed is probability release. Did that make sense? First of all, that any questions about that one before we go on and kind of recap the check sheet? Um, so in the Chuck Stevens paper, they, they, they turned down really low their simulation so that they were only simulating one axon. And then looking at the statistical properties of the, um, of the postsynaptic responses that they saw, um, they were quite confident that there was only one synaptic contact that they were measuring. So n equals 1. Um, and so then they say, OK, well, what is, so before LTP, um, before LTP, we have uh, some, so sometimes we get responses that are around 0. Sometimes we get responses that are around 5 pJoyamps. Um, there's some distribution to these because life is noisy, um, but before LTP, um, our, uh, the frequency of zeros is, uh, is 0 0.6, 60. <coughs> and so if we know our frequency of zeros is 0 0.6, then our probability of release is 40%. That makes sense. So, sixty percent of the time they get a response that's zero. The other forty percent of the time, there's some variability in the response, but it hangs out around uh, around uh, five pJoules. Then they do a, um, really high frequency stimulations that can hang out of synapse. During that time and that time only, their NMDA receptors are unplugged. Calcium is coming in postsynaptically. The rest of the time, every other time, calcium comes in here presynaptically, but none in here. But now, during that high frequency simulation period, just during this sort of two minute window, they've got calcium coming in postsynaptically. And then after that, they still sometimes see some zeros and sometimes see some responses. Oh, sorry, one other thing before LTP. Our average uh, size of successes is 5 picograms. Five. You could think of it as 5 millivolts, because we haven't really talked about the difference between current and voltage in this sense yet. Um, and that is, that's the definition of Q. Postsynaptic response when we get neurotransmitter coming out of our presynaptic terminal. Okay, everyone good on that? Okay. Then, after LTP, um, our frequency of zeros goes down to 20%. And so our probability of release, we infer, is 80%. Um, the average size, when there is a success, stays the same, 5 picograms. But of course now we're average, we're making an average with a lot fewer zeros and a lot more fives. And so uh, over here essentially what we've got is a list of uh, 10 numbers that are um, 5, 0, 0, 5, 5, uh, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, 0, 0, 5, 0, 0. And so our overall mean of all of that is um, uh, zero is going to be two kilograms, I think. Twenty divided by ten, yeah, two kilograms. Now over here, our list of numbers—they really have hundreds, but you know, I don't want to 
of numbers. Now over here our list of numbers is five, five, zero, five, 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 zero, five, 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 and the mean of that is uh, is four. So um, so we've got the same they've got the same size when there's response. It's just that there's a lot fewer failures, and because those those zeros. They, they, um, they believe come from times when, when the presynaptic cell doesn't release a neurotransmitter, and so we have um, a, a relatively high probability of not releasing neurotransmitter or a low probability of releasing neurotransmitter before versus after we've got um, uh, a low probability of failing and a high probability of releasing. But the postsynaptic sensitivity when the neurotransmitter comes out is the same. So, yeah, so what questions do people have about that? So, so, so the conclusion then is that our change is not in the, the number of AMP receptors and the size of the response when we get neurotransmitter out, but instead our, our, um, our change is we're getting neurotransmitter coming out of that presynaptic terminal more frequently. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? It is like absolutely critical that everyone's got this understood or else the rest of this whole the whole next 40 minutes isn't gonna make any sense at all. Um, okay, so um, so back in 1990, um, using this argument here, Roberto Malano came to the conclusion that long-term potentiation was presynaptic because this value changed before LTP versus after LTP. Um, the, the logic of that experiment is a little bit more complicated because it relies on sort of tracking down this, this hidden variable that you can measure only very indirectly. Whereas in the Chuck Stevens case, they thought that they were getting a pretty direct measure of probability of release, just looking at how many times do we get a response before versus how many times we get a response after. That's our sort of direct readout of probability of release, and that's the thing that seems to change for Chuck Stevens. Roberto Malano was more of a hidden variable that he had to infer based on what was going on in terms of this. <clears throat> but then in 1995, um, five years after he said that LTP was presynaptic, and one year after Chuck Stevens did this experiment that he thought was going to prove for all time that long-term potentiation was presynaptic, uh, Roberto Malano comes out and proposes that long-term potentiation is postsynaptic. And in particular, that he has a new explanation for his old results, for Chuck Stevens' results from a year earlier, and everything makes sense in this idea of postsynaptic LTP. Uh, and so, uh, and so, this um, one of the key observations that he made is that if you have if you have a neuron, a, po a postsynaptic neuron. And you're simulating some number of inputs, maybe two or three inputs onto it, or something like that. Um, and you and the postsynaptic neuron, the one receiving the signal, is at plus 60 millivolts. Then you very rarely see a zero, a size zero response. Almost always, you get some sort of response coming out. But if you take that same neuron with those same inputs one second later, and you put it at minus 65 millivolts. Now you see a lot of responses that are zero, um, and uh, and then you can switch back to plus 60 millivolts and see a lot of responses that are not zero, and go back to minus 65 millivolts and see a lot of responses that are zero. You go back and forth and back and forth. So it's not that changing this voltage has caused a permanent change, or that stimulating has caused anything permanent to happen, but um, but on a very sort of back and forth, back and forth, without any permanent change. There's just some instantaneous switch where if we're at plus 60 millivolts, we're getting a lot of non-zero responses, and at minus 65 millivolts, we're getting a lot of zeros, and only a few times any zero response. Um, so, so I asked you at the end of class to sort of ponder a little bit over the weekend, what could be going on? What could be causing this sort of rapid switch? So um, what thoughts do people have about what might be happening where we're seeing a lot of failures when, this, when the receiving cell is at minus 65 and basically no failures when the receiving cell is at minus 65? 
Um, the voltage activated cow, so yeah, um, uh, no, um, but that's a great thought, and uh, can we kind of come over and kind of remind us a little bit more about the, if we draw a little bit over here, but I had before, um, let's maybe make um, a few points of contact here. So here's our C3, that's a presynaptic sound. Um, and then here's our C1, that's our postsynaptic cell. Um, our voltage activated calcium channels are all over here in this cell, but what we're doing is this cell is either at minus 65 millivolts or plus 60 millivolts. And so we're not doing, we've got a, we've got a little zapper here. Right, that simulates this axon. Um, and so we give it a brief simulation, it gives us an action potential. We just sort of zap action potential, wait a minute, zap action potential, wait a minute. Um, but between these two situations, we're changing the voltage over in this cell um, and not the voltage that has, not, not the voltage in the cells that has the voltage activated calcium channels. Um, so that's, that's a good guess, but it doesn't quite work with this. Well, sure, yeah. Would it be because all the NMD interceptors are closed at 16 So, um, possibly, but, but for that, we need to kind of think a little bit and look a little bit more at what's going on for that purpose. Um, so, let's see. So, let's say these are, we've got maybe, imagine we've got, say, 20 NMD receptors at each synapse and maybe 50 amp receptors at each synapse. So um, at minus 65 millivolts, we've got a magnesium block over here. Um, so at minus 65, all of these NMD receptors are blocked. Then we switch to plus 60, and then those magnesium ions all fly away. Um, but a failure, when we see a zero, that means that, uh, there, that, that we, we've been interpreting that as no neurotransmitter coming out, right? So we've got here, this is synapse A, this is synapse B, this is synapse C. And so let's say they each have a probability, um, so probability of release at all of them is 0 0.5, half of 50%. So one time we stimulate and A releases neurotransmitter, B and C don't, we see a response. Another time we simulate an A and B both release neurotransmitter and C doesn't, so we see a bigger response. Another time maybe B and C do and A doesn't, so we see, um, we see another, another response. One time we stimulate all three release, we see a really big response. One time we stimulate none of them release, we see a small, we see zero response. Um, and with AMPA receptors sitting at each of these synaptic contacts, we are always going to see something every time we're transmitting. Right? Um, and so unplugging our EMD receptors isn't going to make things that used to look like zeros go to, go to zero again. Um, so that's not quite right, but you're sort of on the right track about that. Um, so actually, let's do this. Let's sort of um, leave it like this for a second. Um, and then uh, um, just have a sort of brief discussion with whoever's around you. Um, are, what, is there some modification or modifications I can make to this setup? Let me draw a dotted line, because the neurotransmitter doesn't leak between these synapses. They're sort of discrete entities. So we've got synapse A with its amp and MD receptors, synapse B with its amp and MD receptors, and synapse C with its amp and MD receptors. Is there something I can do to monkey around with this a little bit, such that without, when I switch from this to this, and it has something to do with these NMDA receptors and magnesium block. When I switch from this to this, I'm going to get more zeros and less zeros. There's something I can uh, maybe, maybe, um, maybe none of the groups have quite gotten an answer, or maybe they have. Um, 
Does anybody want to suggest any ideas that their group came up with? Sure. Yeah. Um, like changing extracellular calcium concentration, or maybe using CMQX to. Yeah. yeah so that that's, that's something that I guess I guess I may have phrased the the, the the question slightly wrong. That is something that I could do. Like so so I could put on. Um, if I put on a huge amount of C and QX everywhere, then, then at minus 65, I would get all failures, right? All, um, does that make sense? Like if I block all the amber receptors, then, then I would never see a response when my MDA receptors are plugged up, right? Um, but um, as, as me as sort of an experimentalist, I could maybe come on and like squirt a little C and QX here and squirt a little C and QX here, but leave that one alone, and that would work. Um, but actually, I guess what I had in mind more was what, what could I do if I was this neuron? So if you sort of personify this neuron, it wants to do that. And something equivalent that this neuron could do is it could just remove all of the amper receptors from some of, from not all of these contexts. If it removes all the amper receptors everywhere, then we're never going to see a response of minus But what if it removes all the amper receptors from these contexts here? Um, yeah, sure. So how does a neuron remove an ad amper receptors? Is it just based it's on a It's complicated or and nobody figured it out until maybe 10 years later. Um, but there are, um, but, but there are proteins and, um, and proteins can be, um, proteins that, that do their job on the membrane can either be on the membrane doing their job or it can be endocytosed and brought back into the cell, um, which is sort of like cell biology. Um, and so we can, uh, we can sort of swallow them back up into the cell, and now they're no longer there on the surface to receive a blue signal. signal. Um, this may be an obvious question. I, uh, what are they made of? They're made of, they're a long string of amino acids, okay. so they're proteins, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah sure. Um, yeah, if we, if we got rid of, well, not quite, actually. So, so if I got rid of all the voltage channels here on this cell and here on this, so, so let's kind of work through it and see what happens here. So um, at minus 65 millivolts, again, probability of release here is 0.5, probability of release here is 0.5, probability of release here is 0.5. And so um, uh, an action potential comes along, I'm at minus 65 millivolts, so all my NMDA receptors are plugged up. And um, glutamate gets released here, but, neither, but none of these other places. And so I record that as, um, as a zero response, right? Stimulate, nothing happened. Um, then I wait a little while, stimulate again. This next time, glutamate gets released here and here, and I record that, and I see a response because these amper receptors are going to like sodium come in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, next time comes along, um, I stimulate again, glutamate gets released here and here, but not at this one, and these NMDA receptors can't sense anything, so even though glutamate was released, I still see zero. Um, if I got rid of voltage-activated calcium channels here, then I'd never be getting glutamate out. And so, so if we go back then to this, to, so then we do the same thing, but at plus 65 millivolts, so my NMDA receptors are unplugged. Now I stimulate here, and maybe, you know, maybe glutamate comes out here, and so I record that as a response. Next time I stimulate, and glutamate comes out here and here, and I record some, some ions coming through this channel, some ions coming through this, some ions coming through this, and I see a response. Next time I simulate, I get something where glutamate gets released here and here, and I see a response. And so, minus 65 millivolts, there are some times that I record nothing, because even though glutamate was released, I don't see any consequence of it in the electrical potential of this neuron, because the only things that are there to sense it are plugged up. These plugged up magnesium receptors. Plugged up in the receptors, plugged up the magnesium ion. At plus 60 millivolts, any of these points of contact allow me to see and, and, um, and uh, see a, a, an electrical change in, in, in the cell that I'm recording um, when glutamate's released, because um, my sensors the sensors here and here 
are unplugged. Yeah, sure. Um, can, can we assume that the receptive action of the CA3 neuron is irrelevant? Well, so if, if I change it, so I like got rid of calcium channels here and here, but left calcium channels in this one, for example, um, then what I would see is um, only ever get glutamate out of here. But that's mean, not going to change. I don't mean things. the input. I mean, yeah. I mean the, or I don't mean the X, but I mean the input. So like at the. Oh, the um, well, so we're, so. yeah. So so like there, so there are some synapses coming in onto this guy, but they're being they're not active. Yeah, because okay. we're in a we're in a sort of isolated situation where we've got this isolated bit of brain, um, and we can electrically activate these axons, but they're not they're not receiving any inputs at any okay. sort of spontaneous. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, if I remove some of the AMPA receptors, yes, but if I, have a, if I have a synaptic contact where there are zero AMPA receptors there, then at that contact I'm never going to see a response in, in negative potentials. Well, so if we always, if, we, if everyone has an MDA receptor, so, so the interpretation of this that, that they came to is that every single point of contact always has an MDA receptors, but some have uh, AMPA receptors and some have zero. And so the ones that have zero AMPA receptors, we call this one a silent synapse, and this one we call a silent synapse, and then this one we call a non-silent synapse. So that's what this, that's what this business is like. And so, and so we have a silent synapse means it has so every, all of them have NMDA receptors. All of them have neurotransmitter and voltage activated calcium channels on the presynaptic side. But some of them are missing their AMPA receptors. And so we don't detect them unless the cells have a plus 60 milliliters. Um, in the normal membrane potential range. So neuron will normally hang out somewhere between minus 75 millivolts and minus 40 millivolts. Um, and in, well, and I guess minus 60 millivolts. Um, then in that range, we're never going to see a response. Um, if we get our cell active enough, then we'll start to see a response. But we're sort of like, by the time we're really getting much coming to these MDA receptors, they, they sort of have to artificially hang it, hold it here. Um, but a neuron's never going to actually be at plus 60 millivolts for more than a tenth of a millisecond during the action potential. So, any if there's only an MDA receptor, you could imagine a synapse with only AMPA but no NMDA, and those would be responsive too. The critical question is, are there AMPA receptors or not? And then the the um, the interpretation and the idea is that there is that every synapse has an MDA receptor, so we don't have to worry about whether they're there or not. But only some have AMPA receptors, and so only those are the ones that we're going to be able to detect when we're in the negative. Um, well, it does. I mean, so it does. So, so you could. I mean, I could have you say. I could ask you. In fact, I, I, um, I think on the practice test I do. Or if I don't, then you, you can kind of work it out for yourself. So, um, imagine um, here. So here, essentially, we've got a situation where the postsynaptic sensitivity here is zero. Maybe here our postsynaptic sensitivity is one millivolt, and maybe here our postsynaptic sensitivity is is also zero because there's no amplifier. And so then I could say, probability release is 0.5 at all of these contacts. What uh, is the probability of seeing a zero response, a one millivolt response, a two millivolt, three millivolt, four millivolt, whatever? And, and, there's, uh, and, and you could can, you can try and work that out and work out all the possible combinations, but it's going to turn out that half the time you see one millivolt response and half the time you see nothing. But I encourage you to work through that because you very well could see that sort of question on the exam. And then I could say, okay, well, now, five minutes later, we add some AMPA receptors back here, and we add some AMPA receptors back here. Now, what's the probability of seeing a one millivolt response? What's the probability of seeing a two millivolt response? What's the probability of seeing a three millivolt response? What's the probability of seeing a zero response? And so you should work through that. That's, that's worth working through. Um, and actually, we, we might we'll do a little bit of that um, in kind of this part coming up here as well. Yeah. So, and then 
and the brain can uh, can points of contact become sound synapses and non-sound synapses? That's where, that's the next slide. But yes, yeah. So so right now in this situation, we found some 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 evidence that there are some silent, some some contacts that are silent and some that are not, and that's sort of where we are here. That's what I want to make sure everyone understands before we move on to the next. Yeah. Um, so um, even if The, you're never going to detect it at minus 65 millivolts. Yeah, yeah, you're never going to see a response. And the When neurotransmitter comes out, but that's a problem. That's a coin. So, so every time there's an action potential, this flips a coin. This flips a different coin. This flips a different coin. And not really, but you know, we can sort of model it that way. Um, and if this one comes up heads, then we get neurotransmitter here, and we see a response. If this one comes up heads, we get neurotransmitter, but we don't notice it. If this one comes up heads, we get neurotransmitter, but we don't notice it. And they're independent coin flips in each card. And then every time there's an action potential, we have that each one of them does its own little coin flip. Yeah. Does that yeah, so in, in, uh, it, we'll, we'll, we'll work, look at it, we'll actually come back to this in, in, in about five minutes um, together. Yeah. Okay, what other questions do people have about that? This is a pretty difficult concept, and, um, and it's possible that we may not get too much about the language stuff, but I do want to make sure that, we, that, we, um, that everyone kind of keeps up with what's going on here. Okay, so. Um, so then the next experiment that, um, that Roberto Malano did was conceptually almost exactly the same as what Chuck Stevens had done, where he finds now what he thinks is a single axon, a single point of contact, but he tests something that Chuck Stevens didn't test. Um, so what he does is he starts stimulating this axon. So if this is zero, and then this is maybe, I don't know, let's see, um, uh, a 10 picoid response or something like that. Um, he tests this, and what's not shown there, but, but um, he first, at minus 65 millivolts, tests it and always gets zero. And so if, if anyone before Roberto Malano had done this, they'd just say, okay, well, well, the axon I'm stimulating isn't connected to the cell. I need to go find a different axon to stimulate. But now Roberto Malano's got this idea that maybe there are points of contact where there's just an MDA receptor. And so he goes up to plus 55 millivolts and starts stimulating. And now he sees um, responses. And so what he says must be going on is there must be this point of contact here must have only some NMDA receptors. But no AMPA receptors added right now. Um, and actually, it's, it's sort of upside down because the, um, the responses are negative um, uh, in, in there, but you know, we can just flip our axis. Um, then what he does is he uh, does long-term, he, he, he does a period where he stimulates it really, really strongly and even turns it up so more and more inputs are being active that are going to depolarize this postsynaptic cell. Um, and so this is the sort of LTP induction. So during this LTP induction time, the, uh, the NMDA receptors are letting calcium in. And then after LTP induction, he still sometimes gets zeros, but he also sometimes gets responses. Um, and so here, this is zero, and then the responses are here. So before LTP, our synapse was silent. Sometimes we get neurotransmitter out, sometimes we don't. But we can't tell the difference because whenever we do, all it binds to are some plugged up NMDA receptors. Then, after LTP, now we've got some amper receptors here 
And now, sometimes we get zero because no neurotransmitter comes out. Other times, we get a response because neurotransmitter comes out, and we can detect it now because we've got our amphoreceptors that are added to this. Um, and so, before pairing, which means before LTV, versus after pairing, as uh, say after LTV, um, we have uh, before pairing, we had a silent synapse where we were never detecting any response. Sometimes it's because there's no neurotransmitter, sometimes there is neurotransmitter, but we, our receptors are off plug. And then afterwards, we get sometimes no neurotransmitter, so we see nothing. Other times we do get neurotransmitter, but now we've got some receptors there that, that work at a minus 65 millivolts at the sort of normal potential you would find in neuron app. And so we get some non-zero responses. Yeah, sure. So is this why Nicole didn't find anything in her experiment? Um, why, why Cower working with Roger Nicole didn't find anything? Um, so she, in her experiment, set it up so she was only reporting in the receptors. And so she, um, in that experiment where you're only reporting from in the receptors, um, since the end of the A receptors don't change before versus after, we're not getting any ones added. There might have been some silent synapses, but she was already seeing them before LTD plus after. So yeah, yeah, I guess that, I mean, that would work, right. So before and after LTP, um, we're seeing the same in the A receptors. And her interpretation, um, which is entirely consistent with what's going on here, is that there's no more neurotransmitter coming out. Um, Other questions people have about that? Okay, so, um, so uh, there's now actually another group assignment, but I want you to like write down your names and everything, get out a piece of paper and write down the answer for it. Um, coming back, especially kind of coming back to this setup here, this is going to be helpful for thinking about this. Um, what your assignment is, um, again, introduce yourself if you don't know who's all in your group, but think back to the Stevens and Wayne paper, some of the results of which are shown here and we just talked about um, at the beginning of class, and try to come up with a different way to interpret their data where, the, where you change nothing about the presynaptic cell. You're only going to change something about the postsynaptic cell, but as a result of changing something about the postsynaptic cell, you're going to have a situation where before LTP, failure rate is, say, 40% or, or 60% failure rate before LTP. And after LTP, you're going to see, you're going to see zero, uh, a, a no response um, only 20% of the time instead of 60% of the time. Um, so, but you're not allowed to change anything about the presynaptic cell. And so try and imagine something that, that could have gone on in their experiment that could have accounted. Um, and so, and then write that down on the paper. Um, we'll have six minutes or so to do that, and Amanda and I will be, uh, I'll be even walking out of the office as we well. do. And then we'll come back and come up with some discussion and, and ideas about what might be going on here. So, what we had as Thinking back to, to Chuck Stevens' experiment, which the data is over there for that. He, before he even did anything to a synapse, he spent a fair amount of effort, and we didn't really talk about how and the statistical details of it, but he spent a fair amount of effort convincing himself that there was only one point of contact. But, um, but kind of a critical aspect of how he convinced himself of that was looking at the statistics of the times that he sees responses versus the times that he doesn't see responses. Um, and so one possibility that never occurred to him, never really occurred to anybody until Roberto Malano published his paper a year later, is that some contacts might have no amphoreceptors. And so if Chuck Stevens it got an axon like this that made three points of contact onto his postsynaptic neuron, maybe two, whatever, but if only one of them has amper receptors and the rest are silent, then any experiment he does before he gets, gets LTP, it's going to look like there's one point of contact because only one of them is detectable. 
right? Because he's always got his neuron in this range of minus 75 to minus 60 millivolts. So all these NMD receptors are plugged up. And so he could be getting neurotransmitter release out of here some fraction of the time. There could be neurotransmitter release out of here some fraction of the time. He's never going to see it. The only thing he's going to see is when it comes out of this contact here where there's ample receptors already there. Um, and so it looks like, and he can completely convince himself and completely convince anybody else who looks at his data, like before LTP, there was one contact. And he thought that meant there was one physical contact. But now we've got this new idea that maybe there are physical contacts that are undetectable because they have no ampere receptors there. Um, and so he, for LTP, simulates a bunch of times and sees that his failure rate is um, 0 0.6. And so then he infers that probability of release is 0 0.4. And, and also, he's sort of got this idea that n equals 1. So he's sort of convinced that n equals 1. Um, okay, and so your task then was to come up with some, maybe starting from this sort of arrangement, come up with some, um, so and actually, reminder, during the induction of long-term potentiation, he's asked the heck out of everything, so our NMD receptors get unplugged and calcium comes through them, but then after LTP, which is the time that we're really interested in, the NMD receptors are plugged up again, we're still at minus 70 millivolts. So random DA receptors are back, back to being plugged up. So what, what could we change here that's going to change this, change our failure rate? I'm sure you know. Uh, every receptor is going to be added to the previous side. Yeah, so you could put an amper receptor here. Maybe put an amper receptor here. Now, after LTP, we stimulate before, maybe we were getting some neurotransmitter out here, but we just didn't see it. Now, we get some neurotransmitter out and we see it. Then we stimulate again. Maybe this time we got neurotransmitter here and here. We saw that before. This time, we still see it. Maybe this time, maybe the next time we stimulate, none of these contacts release, so we get a failure. So we see something where there's no response. Um, then we simulate again, maybe all of them release, and so we get a nice big response. Then we simulate again, and maybe just this one here releases neurotransmitter, so we get a little bit more response like that. And so now afterwards, our failure rate is, um, is maybe 20%. And so for Chuck Stevens, if we believe that n equals 1, then, then we're going to make the inference that probability of release has gone from 40% to 80%. That's not what happened. What really happened is that um, we got so we had some synapses that were silent, and now they're not silent anymore. And so there was always neurotransmitter coming out. It's just that we didn't detect it a good fraction of the time before LTP. And after LTP, we've got more working detectors hanging out in our synapse that we can um, sense and respond to. So what questions do people have about that? So, um, so in, in the paper, Roberto Malano essentially diagrammed exactly this, where he said, before LTP, maybe we have some active contacts and some silent contacts. After LTP, now, or sorry, during LTP, calcium is the only time that NMD receptors are unplugged, the only time the calcium is coming in through the um, post synaptic and the receptors, and then after LTP, maybe we've got um, some uh, amp receptors here that we didn't have before, some amp receptors, more amp receptors added over here. So, yeah, so what questions do people have about any of that? Yeah, sure. Um, what's going to happen to those amp receptors over time? Like, will they go away? Will they um, they they'll stay there. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 the long answer is it's complicated, the short answer is they stay there. Um, so one thing that doesn't quite fit from this is that 
if we go back to this model here, the synapse that, that was that this synapse that was not silent that we were detecting before is now has more amphoreceptors, and so it should be giving us a bigger response when there is release. This synapse is, has some amphoreceptors, and now we're seeing them where we did it before. Um, and sometimes you might get release of both of them where they're going to add together. And in fact, if you kind of look at my diagram over there, um, I have some bigger responses. So the size of the response when it happens should be bigger. And that's not what Chuck Stevens saw. Um, and he didn't really follow up on this, but some other people who have thought more about the possibility of presynaptic LTP might be going on think that maybe this was overlooked in the rush to sort of throw out all of Chuck Stevens' results about failure rate, because we could explain that with the idea of silent synapses. Um, because the, the, the average size of the responses and even the distribution of those responses doesn't seem to shift after LTP. Um, Roberto Malino, in his paper, did have a little bit of a response where he essentially did the same experiment Chuck Stevens did, and he did see a shift in the size of the responses. And that's another, that's part of the reason why people sort of you know, discounted Chuck Stevens' results. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's something that um, is still not fully explained. Um, yeah, sure. So, essentially, Without knowing Melano's findings about science and that's um, Steven's logic was kind of tautological because he made an assumption about the release rate based on failure rate and said yeah. that caused failure rate. Or like Yeah, I mean, I mean so release rate if, 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 if we've got this n equals one, and he sort of he convinced himself n equals one, but in reality, at least the interpretation here is the reality is n equals three, but only one is working before LTP. And so, but if he's right, n equals one, then yeah, failure rate and probability of later, like, they're like obviously related to each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, sorry, I'm gonna move over here a little bit because I need to co-op just a little bit more board. Um, so, so we've got, in the Stevens case, we've got before, um, we've got this new idea of, so a functional contact. Before, we just sort of assumed all, all contacts were functional. So before, functional n equals one, but are sort of anatomical, physical contacts, n equals three. And then after, um, our anatomical contacts haven't changed, but now are functional in equals Susan. Now all of our contacts are functional. So our functional in equals three. Um, and so for, for Roberto Malino, thinking back to his own results, right, because he not only has to explain Chuck Stevens stuff, he has to explain the things that he published five years earlier. And so thinking back to his own results from five years earlier, um, he was building everything on this idea of coefficient of variation, which equals n times p times 1 minus p. And he thought that n couldn't change. But if we can have some n that are undetectable before, and then afterwards some contacts, these, those contacts become detectable, then, our, then we do have a way to change our effective n. And that is going to cause a change in this measurement that we make. Um, without having to change anything about the free synaptic release. And so thinking back to his own results, Roberto Malino said, okay, well, I messed up. And the reason I messed up is because I assumed it had to be constant. Um, and while I still believe that we're not going to grow a new physical anatomical contact within 10 minutes, I now think that it's possible to have some contacts that are not contributing to the response before that do contribute to the response after. And so maybe in his case, when he was simulating six axons, maybe beforehand, or maybe, maybe those six axons connected to 20, um, branched off and made 20 points of contact, but maybe only 12 of them were, um, were non-silent before and after all 20 of them are non-silent. And so his effective measured in is going to change.
So, so tomorrow on the exam, um, you will have to be able to work through the logic of these silent synapses um, and think about you know, what silent synapses are, how they, um, how they um, function, how they might change before and after LTP, and relate them to um, the data and experiments from Chuck Stevens and Roberto Malano's earlier studies, um, and why we can have now a new interpretation that hadn't occurred to anybody when those papers were, so, were, were originally published. Um, so um, and again, I have office hours today from 12.30 to 2, um, and, and so I encourage you to stop by if you have questions or email me. Um, but right now, before we move on to other things, what questions do you have about this? Yes, Jennifer. Um, yeah, sure. Can you give any information on the format of the exam? Mostly short answer questions. Yeah, similar to the practice, um, similar to the uh, similar to the quiz. Um, there's going to be, I think, uh, forty to fifty percent of the stuff is is stuff from the first week that was also on the quiz, and then the rest is stuff. Actually, I think it's about fifty fifty split between that and this. Um, uh, and so, and it's it's mostly short answers. There are a few things that are like, especially for the unit one stuff, um, uh, like uh, math problems. Um, and for those also, I mean, you'll see some problems that are quite similar to some of the things you saw in the first exam. You should have, oh, you should have a calculator, and you should be able to have a calculator that does log base 10 and, and like exponents on it. Um, you can use your phone for a calculator, but you need to turn it in airplane mode if you're going to be using your phone. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. Does that help? Any other questions about the exam itself? Yeah, sure. The whole class period, an hour and 20 minutes, yeah. Um, it's a tiny bit longer than the quiz was, but it's similar to, to the typical quiz. Okay. Um, okay, so, so before we completely leave the LTP material, I um, just kind of want to return to, um, so the, the sort of the victors in this debate um, are, are uh, Rob Malinka and Roger Nickel. Um, because they had all along been claiming oh, so that um, long-term attenuation was was um, a more ambrosophy. Yeah, postsynaptically. Um, about a month after uh, Roberto Malano published his study with silent synapses, they published their own showing the exact same thing. Um, but uh, honestly, um, while I think that they probably wish that they'd been first, because it's such a uh, um, a uh, historically critical finding. The fact that Roberto Malano, who is one of the champions of, of presynaptic LTP, published it, um, was really um, one of the reasons why it became so widely accepted so quickly. Um, and so um, the, uh, the sort of reasons thinking back, why I think that, that, um, that the postsynaptic side has won the debate. Um, and in fact, if you go to, um, if you go to, uh, a lot of textbooks, including I think your own, um, and look at um, what goes on with LTP. Um, they show NMD receptors and then rest before, during, and after LTP. Um, but they show um, uh, in all of these textbooks um, new AMPA receptors being inserted into it. That's the sort of thing that you find in all the textbooks. Um, I should mention that there are a few people who think that, that, that we got it wrong and that um, there, is, there is some presynaptic contribution, um, in part because of things like this, like this isn't fully explained. Um, but nonetheless, um, the one reason why um, is that with the idea of silent synapses, we now have an explanation for both the 1990 work from Roberto Malano, which had um, in, were in which he had concluded that long-term potentiation was was caused by a change in P, and also the um, the uh, 1994 work from from uh, Chuck Stevens, in which he um, argued that well, if n equals one, then our failure rate is just equal to one minus P, and so we can kind of directly read out P, um, but didn't consider this idea that there might be some some uh, non-functional. Um, in addition to that, Roberto Malano, as one of the two key proponents of this idea of presynaptic LTP, being the one to switch his view, 
Um, again, uh, I, I think the second most dramatic change in the history of neuroscience of that sort um, was really, um, really took the wind out of everybody who was um, looking, at, looking at the idea of presynaptic LTP. Um, one, of their, one of their big heroes all of a sudden switches to the, to the dark side. Um, and then the last thing that has happened since then is in the, in, in the last 20 years, um, the people who, um, who uh, believe that long-term potentiation is postsynaptic have stopped publishing papers where they say long-term, where they say the conclusion of this study is that long-term potentiation is postsynaptic. They've just begun to everything that they publish begins with the assumption that long-term potentiation is postsynaptic. And the questions they ask now are not, is it pre- or postsynaptic, but we know it's postsynaptic, let's figure out what's going on. Um, and so, for example, they look at um, how we get, we go from having no amphoreceptors to having some amphoreceptors, and how we go from having some to more amphoreceptors. Um, and the details of this um, we're not going to work through, but they have, there are other proteins that exist in neurons that seem to regulate when, um, when uh, amphoreceptors get added or not. Um, and in particular, there's one that they, that they looked at um, five years after the debate sort of settled down. It's a protein called stargazin, um, which um, is named because the mice that lack it have this sort of dream. They, 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 um, their, their synapses aren't working so well, and they sort of space out a lot. Um, so they look like they're just sort of like staring up at the sky. Um, so that's that's what that, and they and they determined that that, that, the, that the protein that's mutated in that is critical for regulating insertion of amphoreceptors. Okay, so so maybe back up to this. Um, so, what questions do people still have? Um, again, you've got you know now less than twenty four hours to sort of think through this, make sure you understand it, and then and then answer and apply it on an exam. So yeah, sure. So like, while this is going on, is this, is this, uh, the evidence that we've been looking at is very like uh, data mechanistically driven. Was there at the same time any like a large conceptual debate going on about the pre versus post? Because something that seems to be apparent at least is like you have a, a signaling system here, right? Like right. sender receiver, and. For any sender, they're gonna like the CA3 neuron is probably has connections to multiple um, postsynaptic neurons, yeah, yeah. and for any CA1 postsynaptic neuron, it's receiving inputs from multiple senders. Yep. But unless there's a feedback mechanism from the CA1 to the CA3, um, it seems like the postsynaptic neurons can better keep track of where they're receiving signals from and adjust better. Whereas if you try to say it was the presynaptic neurons changing, presumably it'd be really difficult for them knowing, did my uh, fire yeah. this neurotransmitter do anything or not? So if they adjusted their behavior based on how much they fire, it would affect all of the postsynaptic neurons. Well, yes. Yeah. So, um, so yes, that was definitely discussed. Um, and in fact, Roger Nichols, um, one of the reasons why, sort of even before all, all these experiments were done, he would argue that long-term potentiation kind of had to be postsynaptic because all of the detection is going on postsynaptically, right? It's going on at our even DA receptors. And he says, he would sort of say, it's crazy to imagine that some signal has to go back here before this is going to happen. Um, we actually now know, and in fact, Roger Nichols, ironically, is one of the people who first, um, who first uh, now, um, in about 2005, uh, demonstrated this, that there are many cases where activity back in the postsynaptic receiving cell causes a signal to travel back to the presynaptic cell, and that signal can affect just that one terminal on that presynaptic neuron, and not every connection it makes everywhere. Um, and so, um, in, and in fact, um, there people were looking for and found evidence for some of these sort of retrograde back, backward sending signals. Um, and some of the papers that we don't, that we did, haven't talked about, but that did happen even sort of during the height of this debate, were arguing for potential mechanisms for how there could be a signal going back that could locally happen. Um, but yeah, that, that's, um, that is an important consideration and one of the reasons why Roger Nichol thought that the presynaptic idea was just dead in the water before he even started. Um, but 
um, one of the reasons why I sort of focus on the data and the mechanism is because um, scientific debates like this um, aren't, um, are not usually, the discussion usually isn't about um, ideas as much as it is about data. And certainly the victories and the, and the, and the decisions that people make and the changing of minds um, for, for people who are practicing scientists is based on data and not based on um, possible ideas. Because, you know, I, even before, um, you know, even while Roger Nichols says, oh, it's crazy to imagine something going back, I could easily say, no, I, easily, I can imagine that. That's no problem. I can imagine some signal that gets generated here and goes back. We've got plenty of, we know that there are signals generated here and go forward. Why can't there be a signal generated here that goes back? Um, and so, um, and so, without until there's data, we sort of are like, I mean, it, 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 it's 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 um, it, there's no way to break the stalemate there. Um, for um, yeah, um, and that's actually one of the messages that I sort of want to give, and one of the reasons why I talk about this is because it's not um, it's not won or lost by the idea; it's won or lost by the data in these sites. Um, okay, and so, but I mean, coming back to sort of the core idea here, um, cells that are firing together and are and are active at the same time are going to strengthen their synaptic connections. That's very that that is what is um, going on in memory. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that I'd be happy to talk about that we haven't talked about that when you experience something new, um, there is a change in the strength of synaptic connections in your brain, and that change in strength of synaptic connections. Um, is critical for memory and is also probably the sort of big underlying mechanism of memory. Um, and the sort of uh, cartoonish example that sort of helps to illustrate this is the idea that maybe I have a neuron in my brain that encodes a word and another neuron in my brain that encodes a shape. And you tell me, well, that word and that shape go together in some sense. Well, if those two neurons connect up, and form strong connections, then whenever I see that shape, that word's going to that word's going to um, um, come to my mind, and whenever I hear that word, that shape will come to my mind, and so that that connection between them um, will uh, will provides a sort of plausible physical mechanism for for how memories and thoughts get into my head. Um, Oh, and then, um, and yeah, so, so um, also the, uh, the question that I think it was either Alex or Nikki asked a second ago was, um, so our NMDA receptors don't get larger back in, back in Julie Cower's study because they're not adding more NMDA receptors. And, they're, and, and the, the theory is now that we're not, we're not releasing more neurotransmitter, but instead we're just adding some AMPA receptors. And so even if you have silent synapses where there are still NMDA receptors, we're going to detect those beforehand because they're silent because the NMDA receptors are plugged. But in Julie Cower's experiment where she's unplugged our, our NMDA receptors,